The point is that you're continuously asking for permission. You're asking for permission every time you log in. You're asking for permission anytime you publish anything. You're implicitly asking for permission every time your content is accessed by other people. You're constantly asking for permission, where on a permissionless protocol, you don't need to do that. You are sovereign on that protocol. We are talking about Primal. We're talking about Noster. We're talking about free speech. Free speech. Uh, who would have thought it would be such a controversial topic these days, uh, Million? But welcome to the show. Uh, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, so um, a year ago, um, I had Will Casserin on the show. I want to say it was just right after the new year, maybe kind of similar to where we're at right now, uh, a year ago. And we were talking about Noster. We were talking about his Damus, which was a client inside of Noster. For people that are hearing about this for the first time and maybe didn't listen to that conversation a year ago, let's start off and level set with people so that they understand what Noster is um, and what it represents. And then we're going to go in a lot of different directions with this. So if you can start off with that, that'd be really helpful for people. Sure. Um, interesting that you want to start there because Noster seems to be one of those types of things that people need multiple touch points mm -hmm. before they before they kind of uh, start understanding the importance of it and kind of where it, where it fits in the in the big picture. Um, so it's kind of like Bitcoin. Like we as Bitcoiners, we we saw with Bitcoin kind of we ignored it multiple times over the years. And that uh, one thing that uh, kind of there was supposed to be a fad, you know, last time we saw it was well, six months ago or a couple of years ago, seems to be still around. And not only that it's around, but it's like bigger and more, mm -hmm. more vibrant and more sophisticated uh, than the last time we saw it. So that's kind of that, that's the that's the vibe I'm, I'm getting from Noster. And by the way, this this is what happened to me. So um, I discovered Noster for the first time or kind of like came across Noster for the first time uh, in mid-2022, uh, the 2022, and I uh, wrote it off. I kind of discarded it as something that's um, that doesn't have much of a chance of succeeding, even though I was uh, keenly interested in decentralized publishing protocols and decentralized social media and things like that. I kind of took a cursory look you know, hand up. I, I totally missed it. Didn't take a cl uh, close enough of a look and kind of wrote it off. And then six months later is that uh, time that you're, uh, you know, uh, mentioning there, uh, December of last year, when, uh, you know, people started making a little bit more noise about it. Uh, Jack Dorsey uh, talked about it on Twitter. Uh, even Elon uh, included it in his famous uh, tweet about, uh, the types of uh, social media platforms that are not acceptable to be linked to. So that was that was a funny one for sure, uh, where kind of he listed, uh, I don't know, like um, some of the major ones, like uh, I think it was uh, Reddit and Facebook and Mastodon and Noster. And the 25 people on Noster were like, what? <laughs> why, why is he mentioning us? Like, so... Talk about um, some yeah. signals. Talk about some signal, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah. So for sure, that made a lot of us pay attention. So I was in that cohort. Um, I created my kind of Noster account, my Noster key pair uh, on Damos uh, not even a year ago. I think my anniversary is in, in like 10 days. Mm -hmm. um, so so to go back to your question, you know, uh, what what is Noster? Why is it important? I think it's it's useful to back up a little bit and uh, talk about kind of assess the situation that we have with the web in general with the internet uh it has evolved or maybe devolved depending on your point of view into this state where we have uh, a small number of silos that are completely centrally controlled and we're talking about uh twitter slash x being one of those silos uh, Facebook and their kind of group of companies, you know, group of products like Instagram and threads and so forth being another silo. And this handful of big players uh, exercises absolute control over those silos uh, in the sense that when you create an account on Twitter 
uh, you don't own that account. Twitter owns it. Uh, Twitter has full control over their account, that account. They can take it away from you. They can shut it down. They can remove some of your posts. So they, they have complete control over the account, over the content that you publish, as well as all of your connections, all of your followers and people you follow. So this is the status quo. Uh, vast majority of the internet operates this way. Vast majority of the users, internet users use internet this way. Um, and uh, regardless of what you think about the current owner, of those platforms. You know, Twitter has definitely become a de facto uh, a global town square where uh, the, we as a global community of humans uh, discuss things, uh, important things and announce important things on Twitter or X. So regardless of what you think of the current owner uh, of uh, this platform, the problem is that there is an owner. Mm -hmm. And for something like this, uh, this should be a common good. Clearly, uh, you know, the, 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 if the question is who should own the global town square, the correct answer is nobody. nobody. We should all collectively own it, and we should uh, we should definitely be in control over our own identities on on this network and our own content and so forth. So then, the next step, uh, the the you know, this was identified as a problem obviously years ago. Uh, much before we ran into the latest problems with with like uh, severe censorship in recent years and so forth. So one of the uh, approaches that was taken a few years back was this uh, federated approach where you create a decent somewhat decentralized uh, publishing platform where instead of having one big server and one big owner of everything, you have a collection of smaller servers, smaller owners that are uh, kind of all connected to each other in some ways. Uh, but uh, with this federated approach with Mastodon, uh, you, uh, you have a situation where instead of one big dictator, you get uh, you know, a number of smaller dictators. That's right, that's right. Who, who also have absolute control over their own uh, instances. So on, on Mastodon or these the federated types of uh, systems, uh, the way it works is you as a user, you have to pick which instance you're going to create your account on. You say, I I'd like to you know use maybe bitcoinhackers.org was one uh, instance. So you have to select one and then you create your account there. Your account is then hosted there and is able to access content and accounts from other instances. So there's that connection there. However, the administrator of that instance has absolute control over all of the accounts and content that are created on, on their instance. So they have the ability to shut down your account, to censor any posts you have, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And also, you know, when, when they shut down your account, you immediately lose all of your social connections. Mm -hmm. So that's an improvement in some ways, but also maybe a step back in some other ways, because then, uh, uh, you know, like when you have one global kind of um, moderator, so to speak, um, they are held to a pretty high standard and they're being watched by everyone. Whereas when you have a number of smaller ones, they can pretty much do whatever they want. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there've been some horror stories there. So, um, so this kind of problem area has been, uh, you know, known to developers for a while now, we, we've been all searching for a better system. And then, um, I believe Nostra represents, uh, not only the next evolution, but maybe the, uh, protocol that we've all been looking for. Um, so I don't know if maybe you want me to, you know, dive in and, and yeah, explain so, how Nostra works or. No, what I think uh, is important for people to, to really kind of wrap their head around is just the, t the problem definition up front before we even start talking about like all the solutions and kind of like what's popping out of this. The reason that we've arrived at Nostra is because of all of these things that you've described. I know. As a, you know, you grow up as a kid and you talk about these ideas of free speech and how important they are. 
But until recently, I'd say COVID was probably like this, this moment in time where there is this giant light being shined on this cockroach in the corner of holy mo like the government is truly like manipulating speech here, like in a major way, like people are losing their accounts, they're getting deleted. And like, you couldn't say back in 2020 that COVID came out of a lab, right? Whether you believe that or not, or you think that's total, you know, hypocrisy or, or insanity. Um, if, if you said that online, your account, or the, the tweet or the post was either deleted, you were banned, you were given a timeout for 30 days unless you deleted the post. And it was kind of like, hold on a second. How is this happening on Facebook, Twitter? You name every, every single social platform where you thought you were going to be able to speak your mind and your opinions. It was, it was censored to the nth degree. And so I was just sitting there and I'm like, how is this being done? How is the government able to influence this when these are supposedly public and free and open companies, right? Like, how are they getting them all to do it? And so, you know, I guess I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here of like my own personal opinions. And I'm curious if, if you agree with this logic, but I'm looking at it and I'm saying, none of these companies are privately owned at this point. And Twitter is now today, but not back in, in, in COVID. These are all publicly traded businesses that have a board of directors that, uh, you know, when you look at the ownership of that equity of all of these businesses, it's completely been decentralized. Like uh, as an individual, you might have a couple thousand shares of this company and the, the, the real shareholders of these companies are the big banks. It's the Black Rocks of the world. It's the Goldman Sachs of the world. It's all of these too big to fail banks that have the shares into these ETF vehicles. And so who sits on the board? Who's telling that board what to do? It's the big bankers that have a lion's share of the voting rights on the directions of these companies. And so they're sitting on these boards and, and then they're putting these people in place to be able to uh, implement the, the, the wishes of what these big banks that are in total bed with the government. And if you don't think that these big banks are in bed with the government, like, I don't know what to tell you, but like, look at the response in 2008. Look, look at the response in 2020, look at the Silicon Valley bank, uh, scenario where the, the government just steps in and is like, well, we're going to save them today. It doesn't matter whether they're making bad decisions. So if people don't think that, that the government's looking for something in return for these, this relationship that's happening between two big to fail banks and government, like, I'm sorry, you're kidding yourself, right? So when I'm looking at who is the string puller on these policies, and I have gone off way off on a tangent here. I apologize. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, this I, is I have to get this possibly, this is possibly the main point here. So yeah, please I, go ahead. I've got to get this off my chest. I'm looking at who's the string puller of like the people that are taking my rights and everybody else's rights away from them. And it's the, it's this relationship between, and you can say it's a government agency. I'm just going to say government at large in bed with too big to fail banks that actually control the voting rights of the platforms of Facebook, LinkedIn, you name it, every single social company out there to then put these people in key uh, executive positions that are the speech moderators inside of these organizations. And we know that this exists because as soon as Elon bought Twitter and took it private, which I don't think anybody thought was going to happen because of the, the price tag that for what these companies are worth, but he did it. And as soon as he did it and he, and he peered into these, these puppets that were sitting inside of these, these companies, and the workload that, that was being done, like it was like cockroaches came all running out of, out of the building all at once, right? Now, like just recently, we saw Andrew Sorkin and Elon on stage in what I think, you know, I shared this with, with a family member, the person that I shared it with, th their response back to me was, well, that was really weird. Like, that was just strange. Like, what were they even talking about, Preston? And I said, they're talking about free speech. And like, 
They're talking about basically the banks and the government's really upset that that Elon's able to run the the public square in whatever way he wants without them being able to like puppeteer it anymore. And that like that's what it's all about. And I, I'm I'm saying all of this because if you're listening to this conversation and we're we're talking about this protocol called Noster, and it sounds really obscure and like, oh yeah, there's there's not nearly the amount of people on it today as there is Twitter or Facebook or whatever. It's vital that people understand that there is a massive attack vector for traditional social media and free speech. And when you say that this might this might be the first time we've had a technical solution that there's a free speech protocol, which is Noster, I think that it is so important, like beat the table important for people to listen up, take this very seriously, because I, you know, how what happens? I mean, we're seeing it right now. All the advertisers, Disney, all of them are pulling their funding out of Twitter because they want Elon to fumble the Twitter football and for it to go back into the public markets so that BlackRock and Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan and all the big banks can control the public square once again with the government at their side. Correct? It, it, what, what am I missing in that no, description? I agree with pretty much everything you, you just said. And I think that if we were to pinpoint the problem here, the actual problem, it is the fact that these silos, these platforms have the capability to do these things, to have the capability to uh, censor speech, to uh, block accounts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I used to think uh, about censorship in terms of, you know, people being censored, uh, people getting censored being the victims here. But I, my thinking about it has evolved a little bit. And now I also consider people doing the censoring as the victims of the system as well. Because if you have the capability to do it, uh, you, there will be powerful actors that will show up, that will make you use that uh, capability you have. And yes. this is what we're, we've seen, you know, like I'm sure that people who founded Twitter, you know, Jack Dorsey and the company, like this is not what they had in mind for, for their product, right? In, in fact, initially they wanted to build it as a protocol and had it quite open uh in terms of apis and, and things like that so, so it was quite a vibrant development platform in the early days uh but uh, jack dorsey talks about this and he he talks about how uh one thing led to another and these kind of uh incentives compounded one you know and then you had uh, the situation where you have a number of pow powerful shareholders who want uh, to kind of throw their weight around and then you also have advertisers who uh, your kind of your entire model revenue model is hinging on uh, big advertisers so they get to uh, you know uh, throw their weight around as well uh, so i think well, and, and it's important ahead. to note that these advertisers that are throwing their weight around they're, they're in the exact same scenario as the social media empires themselves. Disney, you name, like go through the list of these large cap uh, entities that are saying, oh yeah, we're not going to advertise on Twitter anymore. Well, who manages their board? Who sits on all the voting rights of these companies? It's the too big to fail banks yet again through the ETF vehicles, right? So how hard is it for, you know, uh, and you, you're seeing Elon uh, say Bob Agner from uh, Disney a lot, but is Bob really the guy at the in the board meeting that's controlling really kind of the shares of the business? So he's I don't think he is. I think it's the too big to fail banks that are managing all those voting, all that voting that's pushing that direction upon Disney to pull its advertising on Twitter, right? It, it doesn't take far when you actually understand how uh, convoluted the voting rights are on large cap businesses in, in the country these days. They're sitting literally right there on Wall Street with the, the, with the few people running these really large banks that are in bed with the government. So sorry to interrupt you. I, I'm just, it, it's the day after Christmas too. Like 
uh, people were hearing this. And uh, so Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh, the, the government and the big banks are trying to steal your free speech. Um, we think it's a major issue. And I, I guess I woke up swinging this morning. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try to get out of this conversation and let you talk more. Milly. I'm just I'm fired up. Um, I, I, I want to highlight one other thing. I wrote an article kind of uh, outlining a lot of this in Bitcoin Magazine. I'm going to have a link to that in the show notes, kind of like laying out at least what my thesis is as to why we're seeing this attack against free speech. Uh, we'll have a bunch of other things uh, throughout this conversation for people to check out, especially uh, Million's uh, client that interfaces with uh, Noster, which we're about to talk about. So um, anything else that you want to highlight here that you think is important for people to kind of understand the problem definition of what it is you're trying to help solve along with many other developers in the Noster space, uh, million. No, no, I think we covered it well. I think now that we've delivered the black pill, uh, it's, it's time to, uh, bring out the white pill and, and essentially talk about the solution because we do have. A lot of good news to share here uh, for people who haven't been paying attention to Noster and um, are curious about the possibilities of solving this this type of thing. Um, so, uh, as you've outlined, the problem is um, overt centralization of the systems that we have, and with Noster we have the ability to decentralize. And no, you mentioned previously that. With Noster, we have a technology that's able to do it. Yes, that's true. And I'll go over kind of how this technology works. Uh, but it's it, better than that even. Not only do we have the technology, the protocol itself, but we have the actual network of people and the ecosystem of applications and services that has already sprouted. And all of this kind of is unfolding in front of our eyes. Uh, and it's really glorious to see uh, how like from humble beginnings, you know, things are organically evolving and growing, uh, where you don't have any central player controlling or or orchestrating any of this. Uh, it's just a number of d individuals uh, doing what's in their own self interest, whether they are developers building applications and services uh, on top of this protocol, or users who value. Uh, sovereignty on the internet and are willing, you know, this early cohort of users uh, was so motivated that they were willing to uh, suffer through some substandard user inter user experience to actually get onboarded onto this network and, and uh, start posting content and collaborating with each other. So to, the network has grown from, you know, from just a few people to a few hundred thousand people who are now uh, active on, on the network. And again, this is not in absolute terms, this is not some amazing number, you know, Meta will come out and say, we've just onboarded millions of people onto threads or whatever. Um, so uh, it's early days and we're growing the network effects of this, uh, this kind of the na nascent network. What's important here and what's noteworthy is that there are a few hundred thousand individuals who value their internet sovereignty enough to have done the work and are using their their own uh, self-controlled uh, accounts uh, to collaborate with each other and post content and uh, help the network grow. So so that's that's really amazing to watch unfold. I've been I've been extremely um, humbled to be a part of it from the beginning. And back a year ago, when I when I really took a closer look and started kind of reading through the protocol, protocol and realized that uh, you know this actually is going to work. Um, it, back then, the as you as you remember yourself, Preston, uh, the tools were quite primitive. So my my thought was like, okay, um, I think this is going to work, but I wonder how good it can get I, in mm -hmm. terms of actual UX for, for, you know, uh, users who might not be so passionate about sovereignty, but just want to use high quality products, uh, and access high quality content. So this was kind of the idea behind primal. I immediately had an itch to, uh, to start a company and start building a product that, that can kind of, um, take the Noster protocol and take it as far as, as we can possibly take it in terms of 
quality of UX uh, performance and these types of things so that um, new users that sign up have a similar experience as w when signing up to some of the legacy uh, media platforms uh, while also uh, joining this new network and uh, being able to be in control over their identity and their content and so forth. I want to give people an example of, of what you mean by this. So a year ago, whenever you signed up, uh, well, whenever you started interacting with Noster, uh, you would like, you would go to uh, your Facebook page or your LinkedIn page. You, you go there and you upload a picture of yourself so people can visually see who they're interacting with. Right. Something like that is just really simple to a person who's been interacting with social, social media for years. Well, when you're dealing with a truly decentralized protocol and you're interacting with it, a lot of people were going over here and checking it out. I had people that listened to the conversation a year ago and they're like trying it out and they go there and they're like, how do I, how do I even get a picture of myself on there? I can't figure out how to like do that. Right. And it sounds really. I forgot silly. about that, Preston. That, that's, it, you're right. It seems it was, silly. Uh, pretty hard back it, then. It, yes. It seems silly for people hearing like, what do you mean you couldn't upload a picture? Well, let's, let's talk about technically what's happening there. Like to upload a picture, where are you saving that picture? Well, if you're on Facebook, you're uploading it into uh, Facebook's servers that are then hosting the picture on your behalf. That takes up some amount of memory, not much, but it does require somebody to host that picture and then serve that picture whenever the inquiry is asked, what does this account look like? Um, so when people were coming to Noster last year with some of the clients, because everything was just extremely clunky relative to where it is today, um, you had to host your own picture. So you'd have to go post a picture in some other type of hosted provider, and then you'd have to point Here's the address where that picture is at on the internet, serve it up. If a person's looking for this, um, you know, this pub public key that's associated with who they are for their free speech. And like this stuff was truly just groundbreaking last year. And I think if a person looked at it a year ago and they tried it out, I know of, of, you know, at least five to 10 people that I interacted with a year ago, like, oh, you got to try this out. This is really neat. It's actual free and open speech. And they like tried it out and they're like, yeah, man, I'm sorry. Like, this is really hard and this is really confusing. I don't even know how to get a picture of myself up there. Like a uh, cool story. Like, I'm glad you and your, your internet friends are having fun, but, uh, I don't see this like working out was basically the opinion because they didn't understand like how raw and how, uh, how much still needed to be built for this to feel like their past experiences. But to your point that you just made, we're, we're here now, right? Like, like your client alone, not even talking about any of the other, you know, numerous other clients that are out there, uh, has, has taken a lot of that burden and it's just kind of like melted away and you don't even know that that's something that's happening in the background on their behalf for them at this point. So talk to us a little bit about like those things that have just melted away, uh, over the past year. Yes. Thanks for reminding me. I think that was an interesting time for sure, because you had to do so much by hand. You really yeah. needed to be, uh, extremely motivated and tech savvy and, and then motivated some more <laughs> and then maybe come back to it the next day to fix stuff that was broken and stuff like that. Um, so. What we've seen since then uh, is just an uh, like uh, uh, such a large number of projects develop the de people developing on Oster, uh, both a combination of client applications as well as services. You know, so, so uh, what you've just described, you, uh, where you need to upload your uh, profile photo or you want to upload some media with your notes. Um, those notes need to, that media has to be hosted somewhere and there needs to be a service behind it uh, that does those things. So rather than having just Facebook do everything, what's actually happening on Noster organically is, is uh, people are identifying the need for the, uh, the various services on Noster and they're building them up and standing them up. And application developers are making it uh, easy to their users 
to pick which, uh, let's say, uh, media hosting service they'd like to use within their clients, of course, with some good defaults as well. Uh, so the user experience now, like across the board uh, for uh, for all the major Noster clients is, uh, I'll say, light years uh, ahead of where we were one year ago, right? Yes. Uh, I think we're approaching, I think with, with Primal, we're able to get pretty close to the sort of the the legacy centrally controlled um, the, the UX offered by those uh, types of uh, entities that have been added for, you know, 10 years plus that are multi-billion dollar companies. We, uh, within the Noster community, are very close, I think, to providing a similar level of user experience. And I would really advise people who haven't taken a look at Noster, let's say in the last few months even, to take another look. They'll be surprised how how much better everything is. Uh, but then, if you look at the trajectory, uh, things are not going to stop here. Uh, and the, the the amount of innovation and uh, experimentation that's happening on Oster is off the charts, uh, kind of uh, at a, on a greater magnitude than what's happening inside these closed silo type of companies. Yeah. Um, because since Noster is a permissionless protocol, anyone is able to publish anything they want on Oster, but also anyone is able to develop anything they want on Oster. And uh, since everything is allowed, everything will be tried. So we're, and we're around to witness all of this unfold and like developers are trying a ton of different things, most of which are probably not going to work out, but some uh, will surprise us. Some types of features or, or products uh, will surprise maybe even their creators at how well they stick. So I think the level of experimentation that we're, we're seeing on Oster is already uh, definitely orders of magnitude uh, greater than on any other decentralized protocol that I'm aware of. But I'm going to make an argument that it's also uh, already uh, 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 bigger than what uh, these massive centrally controlled companies are doing just by the nature of the way that features are developed in these big companies. Right? I've worked at a big company too, I know how how long it takes to take a feature to get a feature out so um the fact that we are we as Noster developers are free to do whatever we want and users are free to use which any uh product or service they uh, wish uh uh the you know users will naturally kind of vote with their feet and or or vote with their patronage patronage and and the best products and services will bubble up to the top. And since most of them are built on op as open source software, uh, they will be replicated by other services and then upgraded from there. Uh, so I think uh, the next, let's say next year alone, I think is going to be quite interesting on Oster. Million, I want to demo something for people. So they hear this, but kind of seeing it and hearing it real time can be, uh, uh, can can really kind of highlight what we're talking about here. Do you have your phone close to you uh, right now? I do. Okay, pull it up. Pull up your Primal app, and uh, pull up your wallet inside your your Primal app. And I want you just to hold up your phone to the camera so that people can see your wallet. Okay. And all right, let's try that. Okay. This, by the way, guys, everybody should know that this was not rehearsed. <laughs> this was not rehearsed. <laughs> I'm literally coming up with this on the fly. Here's mine. Um, this is this. I went to Million's uh, page just like on. And I got a little bit too much light there for people to see. So I'm on Million's uh, page and I see this post that you had four four days ago. You said working on a much nicer image viewer for the next iOS build. And there's a little like lightning bolt icon next to his post, like you, what you would see on Twitter. Uh, the, the interface is very similar to that. And so I'm going to go ahead and click that little lightning bolt and I just, I, it's done. I sent, and you can see it on his phone, right? You see how, what changed on his phone. There's 101 sats there being displayed in his wallet right now because I basically liked his post with sats. Million, it worked. You can turn around the phone and look at it. People saw it real time. Uh, how, how fast that was is I just literally was scrolling. 
I saw basically a like button, but it's a zap button. I have my default set to 101 sats. I clicked it. You saw it immediately send settlement instantaneous. Um, how did I pull up his page? I just typed in million in the search and it was the first thing that came up and I selected it and I'm seeing all of his posts and I could like every one of them do this, pull up, pull up your phone. I swear <laughs> to God, we're just doing this on the fly. Pull up your phone. I'm going to just go maybe, down. Maybe Preston, we should yeah. quit while we're ahead. Huh? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so hold up your phone so people can see this. I'm just going to go the wallet down. or so, some other. The, no, the, the wallet again. So people can okay. kind of see. I'm going to just scroll through your homepage, okay? And I'm just going to like your post. There's the first one I'm going to like. I'm looking at the screen. Oh, there it goes. It hit. I'm going to like the next one. Uh, I'm going to scroll down some more. Oh, I like that one. I like this one. Uh, and each time I'm doing this, I'm sending, and people can see real time, there's just, the sats are just literally flowing to his phone, right? This is crazy. This is totally insane that, uh, we can like, I'm interacting at his, like, if we weren't having this conversation, right. And I'm, I'm reading somebody else's feed. I'm like, Oh, I like that. I'm going to, I'm going to send them four cents or whatever that amount is worth. Right. I think it's about four cents that I just kept zapping to him. I'm literally streaming him money because I'm liking his posts on his social media account. People can see how fast, uh, you know, if you're listening to this podcast and not watching the video, Go to around the 30 minute mark on this discussion and watch this on YouTube so you can see how ridiculously seamless that was that we just did. And it was completely on the fly. We, would, I, we didn't even plan to, to do this. Um, to show you how seamless this is, it has changed by 100x to where we were a year ago when we were talking about Noster and like what it represents. And like this isn't even the part that uh, let's talk about like where you think future capabilities can be, because there's already a Noster nest, right? That's similar to like Twitter spaces that has organically been stood up that you could integrate into your app. I think some others may have integrated them into their clients. Correct. Um, we could do phone calls. Like there's, uh, there's businesses that are streaming. Like I could set a rate. Uh, for the amount, like, I don't want to take phone calls from people unless I'm making $5 a minute or whatever it might be. And my phone number is never given up, but people could go to Noster and they could find Preston and be like, there's a little phone button there. And if, and if he answers, it's this rate per minute, like all of this stuff can get integrated into this, into the future. What, what are some of the capabilities that you're most excited about, or that you think are going to be game changers beyond the zaps that we were just kind of showcasing. Before we get into that, I, I'm, I'd like to dwell a little bit more on the previous point, yeah. what, what we've just demoed here. Yeah. Uh, because that's a perfect example of the types of the things where we as a uh, kind of like a global Noster development community are overtaking the legacy platforms in terms of features and UX. You will not see this on Twitter. You will not see anything like this on, you know, like in terms of real time zapping, real time tipping, and with an integrated wallet, doesn't yet exist on Twitter, even though they've been talking about it for years. And how did we get to this point uh, on Oster? Well, Will from Damos came up with this feature. Uh, he called he called it Zaps to send small amount of Bitcoin to uh, you know to to the author of a certain note, and then early iteration of the iterations of that feature involved kind of like an external wallet. So you have a Bitcoin Lightning wallet that supports a certain special way to connect to Noster applications. And uh, so, so you're kind of interfacing between your a social media Noster client and your Bitcoin Lightning wallet to be able to pull all of this together. And so many people started using that. And the feature became so popular that other Noster clients implemented it. And then we took that to uh, another level where we said, wait, let's see what happens if we integrate a Lightning wallet into the social media app mm -hmm. so, that, uh, so, so that people can easily get onboarded, activate their wallet, maybe uh, purchase some sats if they don't have any uh, through an in-app purchase and a couple of 
you know, minutes later, they can participate in this uh, Noster social kind of activity, which is just like throwing zaps at each other and kind of supporting uh, each other and, and kind of signaling which type of content they feel is important or relevant by actually sending value over the internet. So this is a perfect example of, but none of this was centrally planned. Uh, and uh, Will had a good idea. Uh, he decided to implement it because nobody could stop him. It's an open protocol. So he wrote this uh, Noster improvement possibility kind of document saying, hey, this is how I think Zaps should work on Noster. Then other Noster developers kind of contributed to it. And then uh, this standard was created. And other Noster developers started using that uh, specification, that, st that open standard, to implement the same uh, feature. So any Noster client will be able to um, participate in this. Uh, and and we're, only, we're only a few months into this. So if you extrapolate where we go from here in terms of the feature set and the polish and and the capabilities that we're going to bring to our users, I think uh, the future is looking really bright. So the white pill is, is delivered here too, I think. When I think about uh, what this represents, so uh, Jack Dorsey, he's, he's very involved with Nostr. There's a guy that if I said, Jack, what's, I need to know your checking account number because I want to send you some money, right? He, there has to be some type of interaction. There has to be some type of engagement to pass along that data to me. Then I have to go get a bank to then pretend. But again, I'm, I, I don't mean the demo things because most of our listeners are audio listeners. They're not video listeners. But this, is, this stuff is so important and so easy to demonstrate why it's so powerful. Again, I got, my app, I got the app pulled up. Okay, uh, I went into the search. I type in Jack, right? There's Jack. I see him in my social uh, setting. I'm going to send Jack a uh, hundred sats. Boom. And here it goes. Okay. So that he now has that. I have no idea what his checking account number or anything, but I'm able to find him practically immediately on my phone. I'm able to click on one button and it's saying, how much do you want to send Jack? Jack, you can send me the hundred sats back if you're listening. Um, I want my four cents back, uh, sir. Um, but it was immediate. It's and I could go, I could close this out and I could say, all right, well, who else is in my list? Oh, there's Lynn. I see Lynn. Okay, there's a hundred sats for Lynn. I have access to every single person's bank account information without knowing what it is to send them any amount instantaneously without anybody's permission anywhere in the world it's insane this is nuts how does anybody think they can can compete with something like this and it's all open and accessible to everyone uh it's really amazing being on the Noster network isn't it uh because you can have as a part of your Noster profile you have this optional uh kind of uh setting that you can set the field that you can set which is your bitcoin lightning address and most uh, Noster users have this set to to their Lightning, uh, you know, the Lightning wallet address, and b so so therefore Noster becomes your kind of global address book of people you've never met before. You're you're highly likely to be able to send them some value over the internet. This is really groundbreaking. And this is why Zaps work, by the way. But what you've demonstrated there, you can just use the wallet to. Uh, initiate a send transaction and find somebody in the, in, on the Nostra network and send some value back and forth along with a message. When I think about uh, uh, an unbanked country where, where you go to some country and they're just, they're, they have no access to banking, but they have access to a smartphone. Like, I just don't know how you stop this. This is like a freight train. Yes. Why would I, why would I be, is there a, a, a world in which that is a wrong, uh, you know, what am I missing? I guess is, is, is the question there. So, so Bitcoin and Noster at the protocol level are extremely robust. Uh, so 
at the protocol level and of, you know, we've covered Bitcoin over the years in quite a bit of detail, so don't need, no need to get into that now. But Noster, uh, you know, maybe uh, a lot more people need to get up to speed with. Uh, Noster has no gatekeepers on the protocol level. Maybe this is a good time to kind of explain how Noster works uh, yeah, to those who that. are interested. Let's do that. Right. Yeah. And by the way, uh, you don't need to know how Noster works in order to use it, just like you don't need to know how the car works in order to drive. Uh, but for the for for the purpose of this discussion, where we're kind of uh, analyzing pros and cons of different approaches of publishing online content and uh, maintaining our online presence, it's good to kind of have a high level understanding of of the Noster protocol. And it, and Noster is so simple that anyone can understand it at the high level. I think it, it's so simple. You, you don't need to be super technical. Here is how, here's how it goes. So there are three main concepts in Oster. The first concept is instead of a username and password, uh, users have a key pair, a public key and a private key. The second concept is we use apps. So that's a concept that everyone's familiar with. We use uh, apps or Noster clients to access Noster content as well as create and publish content. So when we create a note and using our Noster app, we uh, create the content and then the app signs that note with our private key uh, so that everyone on the Noster network knows that it came from this particular user, let's say Preston. And then the app sends that note to a set of relays, which is the concept number three. That's the final concept. A relay is a very simple server, which is able to uh, accept notes that have been published by users and uh, store them, as well as respond to requests. So if I, if I hit up a relay and if I say, hey, do you know anything about Preston? Here's his public key. Uh, the relay will respond with the list of messages that it has. So a key point here is that you, as a user, you uh, publish to a set of relays, not to one specific relay. Uh, therefore, your content and, and uh, if kind of metadata about you is replicated on the Noster network on as many uh, relays as you wish. Usually people have maybe a dozen relays set up. That's what I have. People Sometimes people have more. But the point is you get to pick which uh relays you want to publish to and you can change that list of relays anytime you want so any individual relay can go down at any time for any reason without affecting the entire network and that's it that's the entirety of the Noster protocol the rest of the it are just details about uh you know message formats and things like that which we don't need to get into uh but essentially uh this whole notion that a user has a key, which completely controls their identity, uh, and is able to use uh, an Oster app to publish to a set of relays, is what gives us this kind of level of redundancy and censorship resistance. Because, it, and this is all kind of on an open kind of standard on an open protocol where anyone is allowed to, anyone can create a key pair, anyone can run an app, anyone can build an app, anyone can run a relay, anyone can build relay software, and anyone can build this sort of services on top of these, this kind of core uh, layer infrastructure to make things easier and simpler for users. So, you know, like we're already at the point where users don't necessarily need to handle their keys too much, you know, like once you create the account, you have your your key stored, you can you can store it in a safe place, but then you use an Oster client just like you would use any other uh, social media client. As a person who runs my own Bitcoin full node, I back up, there's uh, somebody made a, a Noster relay, basically a turnkey relay for my uh, node. So I downloaded the software on, the, on my Bitcoin full node and uh, just synced it to the content that I've posted on Noster. And now I personally have a backup of every single thing that I've ever posted on Noster running on my own mini server. And I point my client to look at that so that I know for a fact, my speech can never be canceled because I have it all backed up. 
if just to kind of show a comparison to legacy so social media, if you want all of your posts that you ever did on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, you have to go to them and beg for them to send you the index files of all of your previously generated comments. Twitter will do this if you request it today. But let's say they don't like you, or let's say that they have a change of heart, or let's say they delete your account because you said something that they didn't like. It's gone forever and you're never going to get it back again unless you had backed it up along the way every single post, right? So the point is that you're continuously asking for permission. Yes. You're, ask, you're asking for permission every time you log in. May I please log in? You're asking for permission anytime you publish anything. Will you please publish this for me? Uh, you're implicitly asking for permission every time your content is accessed by other people. You know, will you please make sure that people can access my notes or my posts on on on, on X, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You're constantly asking for permission. Where on a permissionless protocol, you don't need to do that. You are sovereign on that protocol. This is why Bitcoiners love this because it's it's the same thing as is permissionless money, but it's permissionless speech. And it allows us to coordinate activities above the money layer, which would be the final settlement of our energy exchange. And it's just, it's just so dang exciting. Uh, Million, what is it that you're looking at on the horizon in the coming year to three years on Noster that you think uh, even people using it today aren't seeing? Like, what is it that you're seeing coming that's really exciting to you personally? Wow. Noster is moving so quickly that it's like it seems impossible to for me to even think about it in terms of like three years out. I mm. try to think about what happens in the next few months or or the next <laughs> year. And honestly, like I'm in Noster full time, and uh, just keeping up with high quality projects, or, or you know, keeping up with what other people are building, is almost a full time job. That's how much activity we have. Um, in terms of things that I find. Um, uh, exciting. We should say that uh, replicating and kind of uh, expanding on the social media systems that exist today is just one of the possible applications of Noster. It's one that has taken off in terms of users actually seem to use that type of capability quite a bit. Uh, but Noster, the protocol itself, is actually more generic and, and capable of uh, implementing a number of different types of applications. Uh, and we're already seeing some of the early kind of examples of some of those with like marketplaces and, uh, you know, like um, uh, auction sites and uh, things like uh, pa Patreon uh, replicas and so forth. So I think that if the uh, one way to think about it would be that anything that has a social graph, like when you when you look at the ecosystem of apps and services on the internet, many of them have a social graph, but they're all closed. Mm. They all have their like as we said, like in internal social graphs. So if you if you have let's say Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, they all support social graphs uh, internally but they're not they're they're completely separate from each other mm -hmm. uh so anything that has a social graph i think eventually will get consumed by an oster uh because every let's say if you're building a professional you know a social site like a linkedin uh type of site on noster uh, if you're a developer of that type of a service you will leverage the open social graph that already exists on noster you will promote your product, obviously, to sign up users. And by signing up users to, you know, Noster version of LinkedIn, you're growing the network for everyone. And you're adding uh, a kind of gravity to the network and adding network effects uh, for all of the other apps uh, that, uh, that, you know, are building on Noster. So when this... Like when you play this out over the years, you can see how um, Noster has the, uh, the 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 potential to grow, to outgrow all of the silos, and and essentially, eventually, to make the silos look silly uh, mm -hmm. because of how close they are. One of the uh, ideas that uh, I know Jack had thrown out there was uh, 
uh, putting GitHub into Noster somehow or leveraging Noster to create the, a decentralized version of GitHub. What's the what's your opinions on that? What's the kind of status? Is anybody actually working on trying to achieve that today? And and I, I bring it up just as like an example of of what you're talking about on that last point. So that's a great example, Preston. I think it's it's an example that illustrates the level of versatility of Noster as a protocol. The fact that you actually can uh, implement something as complex as GitHub uh, on Noster. Um, I think that's, I, I can't think of too many applications that would be more complex than that, actually, that are being currently discussed. So this is, uh, I, I'm, I'm not aware of anybody really diving in uh, deeply to, to do that. There have been some guys tinkering about it, around it, but uh, the need is there. So the pain point is there. You know, uh, GitHub is currently controlled by Microsoft and there haven't been major issues around censorship on GitHub, but there have been some. So the pain th is not like super high at the moment, uh, but uh, you know the the motivation of developers is sometimes is is really as a result of the pain that we experience out there. In yeah. fact, you mentioned uh, the censorship around COVID uh, at the beginning of the show. And I kind of speak with a lot of Noster developers privately, and we we kind of I, I have a feeling that we wouldn't have Noster the way in the shape that we do have today if we hadn't experienced that level of censorship around COVID and other topics. It was really like that's the reaction. That's that's this is what this is kind of the outcome in the free market uh, that we should be very uh, you know uh, optimistic about. I love that. You're you're exactly right. I think that that was a major catalyst for people just wake. I know it woke me up big time. Like, yeah. what in the world is happening? Um, let's let's talk just briefly here about content moderation. So some people would look at this and and say, all right, so you can go on to this protocol and say anything you want, and there's no. I'm I'm gonna put consequence in air quotes here because um. I could generate a, a, a private key, public key pair, um, log into this with as much encryption as, a, as, a, as one could muster, say the most obscene things possible, and uh, tag other pub keys that have accounts so that people, you do that so people could see these obscene things that I'd be saying. And, uh, Nobody could ever know what that who was behind the person that was saying these things. Some people would have an issue with that. What what do you say to the person that has an issue with that? And and uh, how does uh, if a person does have an issue with that, how is it remedied? <laughs> that's that's a profound question. And um, so first of all, we need to recognize that at the protocol layer, there are no gatekeepers. That's the only way something like this can work. So, so there is there isn't anything at the Noster protocol layer that would prevent you from uh, publishing content that many or most or everyone might uh, think is inappropriate and unacceptable. And I think you know we we can all come up with examples of that type of content. So, how do you uh, how do you provide content moderation on such a radically open network? Uh, so there's a number of ways, uh, but the, it, what's important is that uh, the tools to uh, provide, to, to kind of control moderation settings should be uh, in the hands of the user, right? So uh, I'll kind of break it down into a few different categories. So the first category is what Noster, uh, the, the capabilities that Noster protocol itself gives you. So Noster allows you to have a mute list. So the list of uh, Noster accounts whose content you don't wish to see. Uh, so anyone on Noster can have that. You can use your client application to add uh, accounts that kind of manage your own mute list. Now, this go only goes so far. Uh, it's definitely not sufficient to you know uh, 
deal with bots, with spam, with other inappropriate content, because it is so easy to create these key pairs and create new accounts that are post uh, content that you're that, that you don't wish to see uh, that you haven't muted yet. So a number of cl- cl- uh, number of services is kind of sprouting out to help with this uh, situation, right? Uh, so with at Primal, we give you the ability to not only define your own mute list, but also subscribe to other people's mute, mute lists. So you kind of tap into the wisdom of the crowd where, um, you know, I, I trust your judgment, Preston, so I'll, I'll just subscribe to your mute list. Uh, and I might do the same for like a few dozen of my kind of close friends. So that way we kind of leverage each other's work on kind of identifying inappropriate content or, or inappropriate accounts that, that we consider, you know, in our opinion, we consider inappropriate because there, there isn't such a thing as, you know, absolute answer here. We're trying to get away from the systems where we have one arbiter of truth and want somebody telling us, oh, this is, uh, you know, uh, this is what we consider to be acceptable today. It's, we are kind of moving away from those systems. Uh, so to back up, you have your own mute list on Primal, you can subscribe to other people, mute other people's mute lists. And then we, at Primal, we offer services that, um, use AI and other, uh, kind of methods to identify, to classify content, to identify spam content, to identify not safe for work content, etc. And at Primal, you can opt in to uh, subscribe to those lists. So you can say, yeah, I'm, I'm not interested in, uh, you know, I, I, I'd like to subscribe to Primal's spam list uh, because it's so easy to spam on Noster and you kind of need, you need uh, machines to be able to deal with this rather than trying to do this manually. Um, but the point here is that it's uh, the user's choice. And the user can say, yes, I actually will subscribe to Primal's, uh, uh, you know, spam list, or I will not spam filter, right? I might choose another, uh, service somewhere else, uh, where we're not there yet, but this is kind of the, the ideal, this is the direction we're going, uh, in, uh, with uh, Primal and other clients as well, where you build a, an open source client where you, uh, create you have you provide access to all kinds of custom feeds and uh, these type of filtering services and so forth but then uh, you also enable users to pick from third party uh, services for for their own algorithmic feeds uh, or uh, filtering lists and things like that and then when we expose our own services, we do it in a standard way so that other clients can uh, consume those and users can select, uh, kind of pick and choose which services they wish to subscribe to. So this, I think, is the internet we all always wanted, as opposed to centrally controlled systems that we kind of are, are uh, subject to uh, until recently. I want to, uh, I'm sorry, I said that was my last question. I got one more. <laughs> One of the things that I've noticed between Twitter and uh, using the Primal app and, and Noster, the the posts don't seem to be anything similar. Like I and and I don't know how to really quantify this. When I'm on Twitter, well, I guess I do. When I'm on Twitter, I feel like there's an algorithm gaming my engagement so that I keep scrolling all day long. And uh, it's kind of polarizing me so that I'm wanting to see what crazy thing I'm going to pull up next. When I'm on Primal, it doesn't feel like that at all. It feels like I'm I'm seeing and viewing posts that are pretty wholesome and like well intended and are building. There's a lot of developers on on Primal that are interacting about different things that they're building, either on Bitcoin or whatever. Um, but it's it's different. And I think if you talk to anybody that's been on Noster for a couple months, every single one of them are going to say the exact same thing. They're going to say there's something different in the algorithm of, of like what I'm being fed, uh, to view. And when I, when you look at 
well, how do these other social legacy social media companies make money? They make money on advertising. How do you serve up more ads? You have to have some type of AI algorithm that's feeding very salacious or uh, something that is enticing to that person to keep scrolling. But the business model isn't that over on Prime. That's the reason I guess I think that it's very different. I'm curious if you think it's just because we're early and like maybe some of that is going to that more salacious type posts are going to come and start inundating people's feeds. Or is this something that's inherently different that, uh, that you get with decentralized social media? Wow. I love that question. And, uh, I've seen many people, people report this kind of, kind of stark difference in the vibe on Noster versus Twitter. I haven't been, hadn't been on Twitter for a while up until like a few days ago. And I kind of, uh, took some time to browse through some feeds and man, you're right. Like it really, the, the, the feeling that you have in your gut after browsing and it literally doom scrolling mm -hmm. through, um, through the feeds is way different than the kind of chill kind of, uh, positive vibes that we seem to have on Oster currently. Uh, I don't know if this is a result of the network just being young and, uh, you know, relatively small, maybe, although I am noticing something else, which I'd love to get your take on. I am noticing that people who have big followings on both Twitter and Noster seem to be more authentic on Noster. The content that people publish on Noster feels more authentic, more real. So when Jack Dorsey talks about what happened at Twitter on Noster, like he seems to be able to get into more details and we kind of seem to be, uh, mm. able to kind of get, get to closer to his soul, closer to what he's actually all about. Uh, same with many other, uh, people, let's say Snowden. If you want to hear what the Snowden's actual thoughts about like a uh, number of things, he w just check out the way he riffs with the plebs on Noster. He's not, yeah. he like the, the, the posts on Twitter are much more official sounding. Yeah. Where, whereas like, uh, on, uh, content on Noster seems more authentic. Same goes for Lynn Alden. Yes. I'd say. And I think for yourself, like you actually are a great person to, uh, address this, I think, because you have, this is uh, true. Big, you have a big following on both Noster and Twitter. So how do you approach posting on these two different platforms? This is the easiest way I can just, cause you are right about this. I think that when I'm posting on Noster, I know I'm talking to people that, that, that are part of the resistance and know they're part of the resistance and they're there's, there's no, uh, there's no fake people over there. Like they're there for all the right reasons. They're there because they want free speech and they want free and open money without asking permission from anybody. And I think over in Twitter, you know, that a majority of your audience is not that person. And so I guess, uh, I don't think I'm doing it consciously. But I know exactly what you're talking about and you're exactly right. And I think if you talk to Lynn or you talk to any of these other people, Jack or Snowden or whoever, I think they might tell you something similar, but in, a, in maybe a different description than, than you're part of the resistance and you're proud to be there and, and, uh, kind of like, uh, I guess embracing it and, and very proud to be part of the resistance over there. Um, it really is special to be a part of something like this so early. And yeah. I would really, uh, uh, encourage people who maybe haven't taken a look in a few months or ever may, maybe to take another look. It's, uh, it's quite special. Yes, very much so. And if you've already created a private key, you can just, you know, download, uh, try out, uh, millions primal app. You can just download it and take your NSEC and just plug it in there and boom, your entire history of posts are right there. Like you swapped from LinkedIn to Facebook and everything just kind of followed you. It's pretty magical and insane to kind of see firsthand. It is. That's, that's the aha moment for a lot of people where it really clicks. It's like, wait, you know, I was using this other client, but I can use my private key and everything is there. And yeah. a lot of people end up using multiple clients. 
Yeah. Uh, and and there are already so many great uh you know options in Oster. So so that's great to see. Yeah, exactly. Um Million, I can't thank you enough for coming on. This is uh if I would say there's a passion project that I have beyond Bitcoin, it is Noster. And um I just think that free and open speech is so dang important. And to talk to a guy who, in my opinion, is doing this at an absolute like apex predator kind of way, which is the only way I like to see things done. Um, it's you, sir. And uh, I am I am proud to call you a friend and uh, to be able to have a front row seat to what you're building. And it is just amazing. And I can't encourage people enough to Hey, try it out for five minutes. Like you can download this thing in like 30 seconds on your phone and like give it a whirl and see what we're talking about. And, and if you do, let me emphasize this. If you do, please uh, post at me or Million and say, hey, listen to your conversation and we will send you the, I'll send you my default 101 sat return for the post that you say. So uh, try it out, guys. I think you're going to love it. Million, anything else that you want to highlight? Yeah, guys, do that, and you're getting zapped for sure uh, by both of us. Um, no, I would just say thank you, Preston, for having me, and thank you for everything that you're doing uh, to advance this cause. Love it. Well, thank you for your time. As this proliferates, even if you're not on it, it'll be able to infer who you are because you're not on it. These things are so powerful. You're not going to be able to hide from AI no matter what you do. And that's why Bitcoin is so critical in where we're going. This is where the future is going. And there is no, going to be no hiding from it, no matter where you are in the world.